All right, so we're here at the Wiener Lab with Mariah Liston of the University of Waterloo. And so she's going to tell us uh, how, we, how and why we study human remains. So Mariah, if you could just introduce yourself. And okay. Yeah. I'm a biological anthropologist. Uh, I teach in Canada, but I did my PhD at the University of Tennessee. And I've been working on human skeletal remains in Greece for over 30 years from various archaeological sites. Can you just tell us a little bit, a bit about why we study human remains from sites? Well, first of all, humans, of course, are the people who built the archaeological sites, who made the artifacts, who did the things we're studying in history and archaeology. So I think it's very exciting to actually get to look at the people. But when we look at their bones, we also learn about the diet, we learn about the health, we learn about social organization and status. We get a lot of detail, particularly about ordinary people, that we would not get just from reading ancient histories or from excavating buildings and looking at pottery. Fantastic. So you want to tell us a little bit about how we study human bones. Maybe we could start off with how we age an individual and why that might matter. Okay. Um, fortunately, there are a number of different ways that we can get at the age of individuals. In infants and children, of course, we're often looking at the, the pattern of growth and the amount of growth. One of the best ways to determine the age of a child is actually to look at the teeth, because of course the teeth form and then erupt at very specific times. So this is the mandible of a child who died at about somewhere between 18 months and a year old. And you may be able to just see some of the teeth here that are forming that hadn't yet erupted. The front teeth here had erupted and unfortunately got lost because they just have little single roots and they didn't get held well. But we can age from the teeth. We can also age children from the size of the bones because of course they grow from birth onward. Now this isn't quite as precise as teeth because if the child is very sickly, if the child is malnourished, things like that, they may be small for their age, but the length of the bones also gives us a, a good age. When we get to adults, it's a little less precise. We can't get as tight in age, but um, even once someone stops growing, their bones change with time. And two of the most useful ways to determine the age in an adult is looking at the joints of the pelvis. So this is the bone called the os cocci. If you stand with your hand on your hip like this, your hand's actually right here on this blade. So it's oriented about like this. And this joint here at the front, where the two bones come together, it's called the pubic symphysis, that joint changes in very patterned ways. And so starting in, in say, the early 20s, up to about 50, maybe a little beyond, we can get a pretty accurate age. And then back here at the back, the sacrum, the, uh, the bones that form the base of the spine, articulates right here. And that joint surface also changes in very patterned ways. It goes a little bit longer, so up into the 60s sometimes. And then finally, uh, from the skull. Our skulls are made of a number of different plates of bone, and these sutures, which are the joints between them, close and then fuse over in fairly patterned ways. It's not as accurate as looking at the joints of the pelvis, but you can probably see the suture here. It's actually gotten a bit of dirt in it over the years, so it shows up. But back here in the back, it's largely disappeared. And so the pattern of where these had changed would give us the age of this person. All right, so you touched a little bit on children, and I know that your, a lot of your research focuses on children from your study of the Agara bone well. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about studying children and some of the questions or difficulties? Ah, um, yes, children for a long time were pretty much ignored in archeology, span not just their bones, but other evidence of them. So it's, it's relatively, uh, a new field of study compared to studying uh, adult remains. One of the problems in looking at children, um, if for example you're interested in disease and trying to understand some of the things that affected them, children's bone is growing so rapidly, uh, particularly in the early years, that it can be difficult to distinguish between what is normal rapidly growing bone and bone that is being laid down or changing because of a disease process. So there's some challenges in sorting out growth versus what's normal. Um, but the other issue is that we simply don't have as rich a body of data and you know, centuries, literally, of people studying bones 
uh, to be able to understand what's going on with children as much. But it's a field that's growing rapidly and more and more people are focused on. Does it ever make you sad to study children? Oh, it makes me very sad sometimes, particularly when I was working on the Agarab bone well. I mean, it was over 450 infants that had died around the time of birth. And even in the ancient world, when this unfortunately was a part of everyone's life, nearly everyone would lose an infant or maybe you know, many children. I don't believe the people who say, oh, well, then it didn't bother people. We are, we are programmed. I mean, our, our biology changes when we have children. And we're programmed to care for them and love them. We wouldn't put up with them otherwise. They're noisy and they smell bad. Um, so I think there was tremendous grief associated with these deaths. And sometimes when I thought about, you know, some of these children would be a first child, would be a, eagerly anticipated. And I found that very difficult. Some days I just had to walk away and go do something else because I think ancient people did grieve for their children. Okay, let's move on to identity. How do you look at the sex of an individual, for example? Ah, um, it's very difficult in children. There are a few things that give us some hints, but that's one of the areas that more research is being done. I'm actually working on a project right now trying to see if we can tell the sex of, of infants a little better. But in adults, once individuals have hit puberty and all the physical changes that hit that are associated with puberty, they affect the skeleton as well. Um, not surprisingly, the pelvis is the best way we can determine sex because if women can't survive the process of giving birth, then the species ends. And so there's been a lot of natural selection pressure to make women's hips wider to allow enough room for the passage of an infant. And an infant's head literally comes through here and out through here. And that space has to be big enough. So there are a number of features. This is a male, but the, the width of this bone right here. And women, this could be as much as another centimeter wider. Um, this uh, space here is called the sciatic notch. And we sometimes say it's literally a rule of thumb. If your thumb more or less fills up the space, as mine does here, it's probably a male. Where if it's wide open like that, it's probably a female. So that's opening out the back of the pelvis. So this is the best way to tell sex. But of course, the face uh, in particular, the skull in general, but especially the face, can also be useful. If you see photos of someone and their hair is hidden and there's no facial hair, unlike Flint, um, you can probably still tell whether that person is a male or a female. You're picking up on the cues of the difference in shape between the female face and the male face. And so we can look at things, I mean, uh, even very obvious, this person has big thick brow ridges. You see this, this rounded bone right here? Like a Neanderthal. Like a Neanderthal. <laughs> it's a remnant of the, the reinforcement of the bone that goes all the way back into early hominin history. And so it's more likely to be a male if you have that. Males have much uh, larger, uh, squarer chins. And what, what we're seeing actually is in females, the, the skeletal structure of the face stops growing at about the time a woman enters puberty. So at the age of 11, 12 years, a woman has the, the skeleton she's going to have. Males enter puberty about two years later on average, so their face continues go, growing through that time, but then it continues to grow. It doesn't stop. And so in the end, males have longer, broader, and more projecting faces than females. And there are lots of different cues we can pick up on that help us see that. All right, last question for you it has to do with disease. I know that a lot of your research focuses on disease. How do you study disease and what can we say about it? And how does it help us understand the past? Well, the diseases are, are fascinating and fun and a bit of a challenge because there are no specific markers, or almost none, that say, I'm this disease, I'm leprosy, I'm you know, tuberculosis, whatever. Bone responds to disease fairly slowly. Um, we need to be sick, and our bones need to be affected for a minimum of about two weeks as adults to see any response. And to get a large response, it's often a disease that affects you for years. So first of all, most of the things that kill people never show up on their skeletons. You know, if you excavate a big village cemetery, some ancient town, 
three quarters of the people or more look perfectly healthy, except for the fact they're dead. Obviously something killed them, but it just doesn't show up on the bones. So we're dealing with a small subset of disease anyway. But then all bone can do is either take away bone or add bone. And so we look for bone missing where it should be or bone being laid down where it shouldn't be. And then the patterns of that together with the age of the individual, the sex of the individual to some extent, um, and then also the things that might have been stressing their society at that time. We have to put all of that together to look at disease. But it's always really exciting when you've figured something out. It's like, oh, that's what's going on here. That's always a great moment. <laughs> One last question. I'm sorry. We're all thinking about disease right now. <laughs> yes, and as someone who's thought about disease a lot in the past, is there anything, any context that, that gives you for dealing with today's world? Um, I have to say that the fact that I have studied some major diseases in the past, I'm working on a site that has two mass graves of individuals who probably died of plague, bubonic plague. Um, it was the first time it hit Europe uh, in what we call the Justinianic plague. But I also have to say that the past gives me hope for today. Humans have been much more devastated by diseases in the past, plague, smallpox, all sorts of things that, that were much more deadly and we didn't have the medical structure to support them. And yet human society survived and recovered and moved on. And while we need to take this seriously and we need to be careful about not, about not continuing the spread, I also have hope that there is an end point with this, and we're going to get there a lot faster because we have the medicine and the scientists who can help us reach an end point sooner. All right. Well, thank you, Mariah. I really appreciate it. My and, pleasure. Uh, 